Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to present a kind of like end-to-end -end transaction flow of what a typical transaction on Celestia will look like. And we've done this every on-site. Um, and it's important that we go through this again, but only for the new team members to understand like what, we, what are we building as a product, but also for the, for the existing team members so that they're reminded um, regularly and that, so that ev the big picture can fit into everyone's mind to see like what, what, how you're working on fits into the big picture of all the other components in their modular stack. But I'm gonna be kind of like presenting on this from a very specific angle. I'm gonna be presenting what the end-to-end -end transaction flow will look like specifically for an optimistic roll-up on Volkit that uses Celestia as a DA. Uh, but obviously there's of course other roll-up frameworks like like Server SDK for example, OpStack and so on and so forth. Um, they might have like sli very slightly diff differing architectures, especially if it's a ZK roll-up, but this should still help you understand the general concepts. So let's say you have a, let's start with from the perspective of the user. Like what does the user, what does the end user ideally run on their machine? Like a user that wants to use a roll-up. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the core components of Celestia is that this idea of light node so like, unlike most like other blockchains, like Ethereum, for example, the way you interact with the chain is that you, ha you run a MetaMask wallet, but you connect to a centralized service. It has what's called a centralized RPC endpoint, like Infura. And that centralized server runs an Ethereum node and tells you what the state of the chain is. But also, that's one of the kind of like biggest problems that need to be solved with Web3 right now. It's not really, the whole point of Web3 is that it's supposed to be trust minimized and that users should be first class citizens of a network. So that's why uh, we've kind of like put a heavy emphasis on making sure that people can run light, light nodes that connect directly to the network and can get information directly from the network instead of having to connect to some centralized service. So the first thing that the user expect, is expected to run, um, and a user by the way, could be like an exchange or a company or a custodian or, or, or anything like that. The first thing they're expected to run is this um, the Celestia light node. That's the, that's the first thing. And then uh, Celestia light node does a few things. It, uh, it connects to the Celestia peer-to-peer -peer network and you can interact with full nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network to ask it for like what the state of the network, like what, what, what the latest blocks are. And it also performs something called data availability sampling. So you have this, um, you have this like core, this, this, this Celestia core network, which I'll, like, I'll draw that in blue. <coughs> um, and then in this, in this core network, you have these Celestia full nodes so like, or I can call, or, or in this case, I'll call them, they, they could be validators as well, but I'm going to refer to full nodes as a general concept that also encompasses validators. Yeah. I don't think you can call them storage nodes. But I also do want, I'm also referring to storage nodes as well. So like, they all, because they don't, they don't sample, that nodes don't sample from consensus nodes. They sample from storage nodes. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just going to refer to them as full nodes um, for now. And these, uh, like these full nodes are connected to each other in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And these, these light nodes, um, they, uh, they can sample block headers from the Celestia network. So the Celestia network, they the Celestia network produces Celestia blocks. Like what, what is inside the Celestia block? Uh, like a few, few, a, few, a few core components. <coughs> but um, like the most important component is this, this concept of a, of a data root commitment called a data root. So we, we, we call, which we call data root. And what, and what this data root is, is basically a medical tree of all the data in the chain. 
Um, <coughs> Like in the least of these local history are like the data that people have submitted to Celestia. So these are like called data blobs. Like data blobs could be different lengths. So like a, you could have like a data blob that consists of like three pieces in, in the tree, or like two pieces. So like all of these distinct things are like data blobs. And you can you, and light, load, light nodes can prove can check a proof that they can receive these data blobs and check a proof that they've included it in the data root. Via Merkle proof. <coughs> so now let's but let's go back to the end-to-end -end transaction flow. It's going to become more clear how this how that interact how the light node interacts with the network. Uh, once a once a light uh, when you run on a light node, you're also presumably also going to be a user of a rollup. So there's also going to be like a rollup network. <coughs> And this like rollup network also has its own full nodes. That are, that are also connected to each other. <laughs> and then the, the user also has to run on a machine, not only a Celestia light node, but also a rollup light node. So um, now let's now let's say that the user wanted to Submit a transaction to the network. So what, let's look. Let's look up what the what the what the transaction flow is. Like where does that go? The user constructs the transaction. Let's call it like TX. Let's call it TX on their own on their on their um, local machine, and then they send that transaction to a full node on the rollup network. So let's say they send it to a full node on the rollup network, and that full node gossips it to other full nodes. And then they all receive like dependent transactions on the thing. Does anyone have any questions so far? So, so someone said something. Okay. And then what did the what did the what did the folders do with this transaction? They make it into they put it into or they sequence it into rollup blocks. So I mentioned that there's Celestia blocks, but there's also another another thing called the roll, roll, roll the rollup also has its own chain. And that chain get the data of that chain, the blocks of that chain get, gets posted into Celestia. So a rollup is basically like a chain inside a, a chain. And to visualize that, so let, let's see what that, what that looks like. So, so the full nodes collect these transactions, and these full nodes could be sequences. And then they, produ they, put that, they, they, they produce these rollup blocks. So let's say like this latest block, it, it, it contains the user's transaction, TX. So then they've created this latest rollup block. <coughs> what then what do they do with the block? This block has what's called a um it's what's called it, have, it has what's called like a a, a, a commitment. Uh a, there's a there's a let's see how how to describe it. Yeah, let's, let's just call it a data commitment for now. And then this date commitment, what is th this date commitment is also a Merkle tree. So um, let's say like, let's, let's see what that looks like. So uh, let's say like it, it's just a Merkle tree of four. And like part of that Merkle tree could, could be the user's transaction. Now, the key thing to realize is that what happens is that the, um, the uh, yeah, the roll, the, the roll up sequencer, they post this block data into the Celestia network. So this, 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 this block, they get, it gets posted to the Celestia network. And then it gets included inside um, the, the a Celestia block. So, and then this rollup block could be inside the actual Celestia block. For example, it could be one of the blobs like here. So I'll, like it's color coded red, because this data is inside that data. <coughs> and then the key thing to realize is if you look at this data commitment here, this data commitment is a is a tree is a medical tree in itself, but it's it's actually um, a subtree in this bigger tree. 
So like, for example, um, so this is four, so let's say this is, this, is, this is the data blob. So like this, so, so this, 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 bi this smaller tree is actually inside this bigger tree. Like uh, this data here in the tree is the same data as that. So it's like, does, does that make sense so far? Does anyone have questions? Yeah. Um, Uh, uh, well, <coughs> the namespaces aren't actually a necessary component for this to work. The namespaces are more like an optimization mm -hmm. to make it possible to, for, for people to later download this data to know where it is. So, the, the, so instead of them having to search the whole block, they only have to search the namespace for that data. That's the implementation detail, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that the hadoops and the data group are the uh, chunks, right? Yeah. Whereas the loops and the data commitment on top are the actual transactions. No, they, they, they're actually also the chunks. They should, they should also be chunks. So the goal of choosing to commit to transactions is like the same thing. Yeah. And this, is like, this is what the new blob module API is supposed to achieve. There's this new blob module API in Node where you can, you can add data to it. You can specify the data, and then you can like call a function, say calling, this called commit, that computes the commitment for you. Mm -hmm. That it commits what this, what this subtribute is. So that you know, when you post it to Celestia, you know it's, you know it's gonna be a, in the tree, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's, so so far of this, and then, so this is it, kind of like, and then the user's transaction kind of ends up in Celestia here. So to summarize, I've, so far I've described the entire read flow, like, I mean the write flow. How does a user write data to Celestia? To summarize, like the user submits a transaction into a roll-up network, to the sequences of the roll-up network. They make a roll-up block, and that roll-up block gets included inside the Celestia block. And then that, 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 that transaction, the data of that transaction is inside the Celestia block. That's the kind of write flow so far. But now look at now, now less. Now let's look at the read flow. Well, what do I mean by read flow? Like how does the, how does the user, let, uh, now we've talked about like how does the user add data to the chain, but how does the user uh, read data from the chain? Like how does it read this balance, for example? So to understand that, we also have to understand that the rollups blocks have something called a state, commi a state commitment. So like, <coughs> I'll do it in a different color to signify that this is the read, the read flow. I'll do it in green. But first of all, like, what, what do we mean by state? And this is basically, I mean, this is for like achieving this optimistic rollup, but like, what do we mean by the state of the rollup? By state, we mean like, less, it's like kind of like, a, imagine like, um, an Excel spreadsheet that says what everyone's balance is. It's so like if you imagine like it's, a Excel, it's like an Excel spreadsheet, and then like you have um, you have like two 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 columns. The first one is like name, and then like the second one is balance. So like um, <coughs> like you, ha you might have Alice and Bob, and then like let's say they have like five coins each or something. This is what we mean by state. Like the user, the, like the user might wanna see, okay, please tell me what Alice's balance is, or what, what is Bob's balance? And that's, that's what we mean by state. We, know what, we need to know what, what the state of the chain is. And the roll-up block, they commit to the state of the chain using a Merkle tree, make, using a Merkle root. And uh, it's kind of like, it's very similar to this data commitment from Merkle root, but instead of committing to the transactions that happened, it commits to the state of the chain. So like it, it, like it might look something like this. Uh, so like, 
this is like a very um, basic example, but like if it was a sparse Merkle tree, let's, let's say it's like <coughs> let's say it's like a four um, leaf tree. Like part of the tree might say like the Alice equal five, and another part might say like Bob equal five. And that kind of like it commits to the state. This root it commits to the state of all the balances in the roll-up. So now, how does the user uh, kind of like know what Alice or Bob's balance is? Um, so what happens is that, like, what happens is uh, the roll-up networks, full nodes, they need to be able to synchronize new roll-up block headers posted to the Celestia chain. So then there's this kind of like read flow back from the Celestia chain, back to, to the roll-up network. So like, um, these block headers, they are read by these roll-up full nodes. So it's like, there's, there's this kind of information flow going this way. Uh, roll-up block header, uh, or roll-up block, the, the actual roll-up blocks themselves. And how, how do the, how do these roll-up full nodes, they actually, how do they actually what kind, of, what, what kind of query do they make to get these roll-up blocks? So in Celestia, we have this concept of namespaces where each, uh, like when you post the data blob to Celestia, you can, you can specify what namespace is associated with that blob. You can kind of think of it like a, like a, like a Twitter hashtag or like a channel on a walkie-talkie. So like if you tweet something and then a specific hashtag, people can later search for that hashtag to see what people have tweeted under that hashtag. And like anyone can tweet under that hashtag. So the na a namespace is kind of like the same thing for a blockchain. You can post data to a chain under a specific namespace, and then people can later search the, na search the chain for, for data under that, under, that names under that namespace. So that roll-up has like a specific, that roll-up chooses a namespace. And then it, it calls a uh, API call in Celestia Node called get data by namespace. Uh, yeah, it gets the data by namespace, and then um, the roll-up full nodes they they uh, send the header of the roll-up, and by header what do we, what we mean by header is the actual roll-up block everything everything about the roll-up block everything inside the roll-up block, except for the actual transaction data itself. So they send to the uh, light client basically like um, like roll-up header. Oh, what, what does that consist of? It consists of the state commitment and data commitment. <coughs> and then, um, because the because the because the light nodes have this state the state commitment, they can also ask the full node, "Hey, can you please tell me the the balance for Alice?" And then once, once the, um, the full node responds to the light node, it has to prove that that's Alice's balance. And how does it prove to that? Prove that it proves that by using something called the Merkle proof. It's like it can't just tell, it can't just the roll-up full node can't just the light node tell the light node Alice ba Alice's balance is five. Believe me, it can't just do that. What it needs to do is it needs to say like Alice's balance, Alice's balance is five, and here's a proof for it. And the proof is basically like what's called the Merkle proof. It's like it shows that it shows a path from the root to the to the, to the leaf. It shows that this uh, this this commitment is actually committing to the fact that Alice's balance is five. The problem here, which is kind of like why Celestia exists, does anyone know what it is? In yeah, but before that, like what could what what could the roll up full node do maliciously in this flow while telling what's telling the user yeah so what could happen is that what happens because the trust assumption for wallop network is that we need to assume that the full nodes are, are dishonest all that means is that full, the full nodes might be committing to invalid roll-up blocks they might be generating invalid roll-up blocks and what does it what does it mean to generate invalid roll-up block 
means like they might introduce like a malicious transaction in the block that like, for example, prints more money and gives it to them or like steals someone's balance. Like for example, they might like, they might like have a malicious, they might add a malicious entry to their state. <coughs> I say like Charlie or something and they put the balance is like, like a thousand or something. But according to the rules of the roll-up, there's no reason, there's, that's not a valid thing to do. According to the rules of roll-up, you can't just give someone money. That doesn't exist. But they might create a roll-up block that has such a transaction in it. Cause, because we can't assume that they're honest. Because the whole point of roll-ups is that they're trust minimized so that you should be able to create a, um, you should be able to have a roll-up with a single node and you don't have to trust that node. Because the whole point of a roll-up is that you can create your own blockchain without, without having a secure or valid data set. So, what, so the way that optimistic roll-ups deal with that case is that they, uh, they use fraud proofs. And the general idea for fraud proof is that like, um, it's, like a, it's called like state transition fraud proof. If you assume that each, every roll-up has something called a state transition function, let's, let's say like STF for short, you, you can think of the STF state transition function is basically a black box. What does that black box do? That black box uh, takes in two things. It takes in two things. You, you put two things in that black box. Uh, the first one is uh, new transactions. Like let's say one transaction. And the, first th the second thing is that you put the state inside that black box. The state, again, as I said, is this, is this spreadsheet that tells everyone what, what everyone's balance is. And then, and then what is the output? It outputs uh, the new state. Um, but this or, or an error, basically. And it returns the error if you put an invalid transaction. Like if you put a transaction that uh, like says, moot, like give, <coughs> like, I don't know, like give Charlie a thousand coins. Let's say, let's say the input transaction is like, uh, like give Charlie, increase his balance by a thousand coins or something. That's like, a, it could be like an invalid transaction, for example. But like that should, that, that session, in that case, that state transition function should return an error. It shouldn't return in a new state where Charlie's balance is, is a thousand. <coughs> so it turns out like, <coughs> you can prove to a light client that, that the roll-up full node committed to an invalid block. And it's pretty, uh, you can, it's pretty easy to prove it to them by giving them the right data. And what, that, that the data that you need to give them is like the following. Um, like what does a what does a fraud proof consist of? Like how do you prove that some roll-up block has an invalid transaction with an invalid state commitment? You, you give them um, what you have to do is you have to give them the state of the chain. Uh, you have to give them like the state commitment of the chain before the transaction. So like uh, it's what we call the pre-state route. You give it. You give them the the, the, the commitment to the state of after the transaction. And then you give them the transaction itself. And then you also give them what's called witnesses. But that's not that. That's I'm not going to go into that right now. It's not. It's, a, it's not an important detail. But if you if you give a light client this information, what they can do is they have the information required to put these things inside this black box and see what came out of the black box is not the same as what the full node said should come out of the black box. And they say it doesn't match, so you can tell that the full node is being malicious. Like if that black box should actually reset the error, but the roll up full node says actually it doesn't reset the error, it returns this new balance, they can, com they can compare this, the output of this black box and see it, doesn't, it does not match what the, um, Roll up said it would match. <coughs> yeah. So the witness is basically you have to give a medical proof of all of the state that the transaction accesses. Like uh, in this case, like you might have not, uh, like this is kind of like a contrived example, <coughs> but um, 
like, like you might have like a like a key for Charlie because you're, you're you're accessing Charlie's key, so you would give them a record proof for Charlie's key, and they say this kind of a, this is a, a better example. This is kind of like a controlled example, but let's say let's say the better example is like um, this. What the transaction does it subtracts it subtracts uh, it subtracts a thousand coins from Bob, and it sends a thousand to Charlie. That's like a straightforward transaction where you're sending someone's money. Well, what the fourth proof would look like in that case is you would have to give a medical proof for Bob's balance and Charlie's balance. So like, it would be like this. And then the state transition function would turn an error because you can't subtract a thousand coins from Bob's balance because it's only got five coins. Th does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So then the question is like, so now we understand, any other questions about the fourth proof? Okay. So now, assuming that we have this fraud proof, who generates this fraud proof? So we have this other actor on the chain called, um, well, it's not, it's not a specific actor, but like basically any full node on the rollup network can generate these fraud proofs. So like anyone can join the rollup network and become like a fraud proof generator or like a watchman of the chain. So like if there's a fraud proof, um, like let's say like this is, this, like, this, like this node is honest, they can send these, they can send a fraud proof. To the light node. And if the light node receives a fraud proof for a roll-up block, it does not accept that block as valid. It rejects that block. It, it, like, it pretends it was never there. And you can also, like, for example, like punish the you can like slash, for example, the full node that generated that block. You can have like a rule where we say we want to slash them. Because maybe they put up some bond or something. Now so now we've explained like how fraud proofs work, but now there's another problem, and this is where Celestia comes in. Does anyone want to describe that problem? <laughs> Yeah. So the the problem is that um, just because just because um, we know we know how to generate fraud proofs does not mean that the data to generate that fraud proof is available. Because like what could happen is that um, if the like if the celestial network or the data, if the underlying data database layer is malicious, what could happen is this. What could happen is that. The 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 uh, the the validators of the of the data availability layer, they might only release the block header, but they might not release this the actual data that points is pointing from the block header. Like they might release this block header, they might release the data root commitment, but they not they might not tell you what this data actually commits to. So you don't know what data is in the chain. You only know like here is what the commitment is, but you don't know like what the actual data in the chain is. And if you don't know what the data in the chain is, you can't challenge anyone. You can't challenge your rollup blocks if they're fraudulent, because you don't know if they're fraudulent, because you don't know what the data is in the first place. And this kind of this is obviously uh, problematic. This is like why rollups need a data availability layer, because rollups can't be can't be responsible for their own data availability, because you ha then you have to trust the the, the rollup operator. And the whole point of rollups is that you, that you shouldn't need to tr you shouldn't need to trust the rollup operator. So, does that make does that make sense so far? But I think I think there's like a good analogy for it. Um, something to do with football or something. Do you want do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> uh, the analogy is that um, I, I think of data availability layer kind of like the um, cameras that are recording uh, like a, a football game and when something happens and people want to see like what actually transpired, yeah. they can like rewind and like look at the video recording, basically. And then like if the referee is like saying that there's something fraudulent that happened on the uh, on the um, the field, people can actually go and inspect and like verify that fraud. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. Another analogy is kind of like. It's kind of like uh, the court system. It's like if you want to accuse someone of murder or something, the best evidence, like you should have CCTV evidence. But like if you don't have CCTV evidence, then you can't really prove it. So like this is kind of like if there was if if no one is recording or if there's no footage, then you can't prove the fraud. Yeah. Yeah, so we've described why it needs why it's needed for fraud proofs, but only optimistic rollups use fraud proofs. 
So like why is data availability also needed for ZK rollups? Because ZK rollups don't use flood proofs, they use validity proofs. So with ZK rollups, you don't need to, you prove ahead of time using zero knowledge cryptography that the rollup is valid. So it's like, whereas optimistic rollups are kind of like, they're kind of like um, innocent, uh, innocent until proven guilty. Validity rollups are like guilty until proven innocent. You only accept the block if you know it's valid using, because the ZK proof proves it's valid. So there is no fraud proof. So then why do ZK rollups still need data availability? The reason why they need, they need data availability is just because you can prove to someone that the state is correct does not mean that they, they actually, you have actually told them what the actual state is. And this could be problematic. So for example, like a ZK rollup might say, you might, like, might, might advance the state, but no one knows what the actual state is. Like users don't know what, what their balance is or, or, or anything like that because the transactions behind that state transitions have not been published. So no one knows what the actual state is. And that's basically, that's basically like a massive aliveness failure, but it could also be, it's also potentially a safety failure if you assume it can be used for blackmail because like the ZK sequencer could like blackmail people by saying, I'm not going to tell you what the state is. And therefore you no one else can advance the chain except for me until you, unless you pay me or something, or something like that. So in, sum in summary, like you need to know the, like you need data availability, pro uh, data ability for ZK rollups because you need to know what people's balances are for other people to build on the chain and to advance the state and to know what the balances are and to even use the chain in the first place. Does that make sense? <coughs> so, yeah, so as I, as I described, like how do the light nodes, um, so that, that means like when a light node receives a rollup header, they can't just accept it as valid immediately. They also need to make sure they have some kind of guarantee that the data behind that data commitment in the rollup header was actually published to the network. Because if they can't verify that it's public, if they don't know if it's published to the network, then they don't know for sure if someone can generate a fraud proof. Because the whole security for all, the whole security of a light node relies on the assumption that you, the light node knows for a fact that if something is wrong, someone can generate a fraud proof. But you can't generate a fraud proof if the data is not available. So before the light node accepts the rollup header into its, into its software, it needs to first of all check in the first place to have some kind of assurance or guarantee that the data behind the rollup header is available so that it can be audited by someone that can generate a fraud proof. And so there's like different levels of security that you can do that. Like the most, uh, for like what we call like a super light client, the way that they would do that is because the, um, the oh, by the way, this is kind of like slightly wrong. This, these, these arrows should be going into the rollup light node, not the celestial light node. But the way that they would do that is that um, the, the, celest the user, remember the user is also running a celestial light node. So the user also receives the block headers of the Celestia chain. <coughs> and so they have these block headers and they also know the data root of every block in the Celestia chain. And so like, to, and, so, uh, and remember what I said, the, the data for the router block is like, a, is like a smaller tree in this bigger tree in the Celestia block. So all they have to do technically to check that that data commitment is theoretically available is check, is, is, is receive a Merkle proof that this big, this smaller tree, the root of this smaller tree is inside this bigger tree using a Merkle proof that is inside the, that's inside the data root. And the Merkle proof is just a path from the root to, this, to, the, to the root of this smaller tree. And that proves to the rollup the, that the data behind this rollup is actually inside the Celestia block without needing to actually download all the transactions of the, in that rollup. Because they don't need to download all of the the entire transaction data, they just need to get the root node of the tree and check that it's inside the, inside the bigger tree. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. But that implies that the rollup header or like the rollup data commitment is always exactly the same as the yeah yeah, yeah. Like rollups are not supposed to use an MMT or something, right? How, how they can use that. The, the, they. Um, they ca yeah, they, they do they have to or is it under this they would have to, yeah. yeah. But there's other ways of constructing a rollup that does not involve this thing. But I'm just doing this, explaining this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. this is the base case, okay? <laughs> like there's other ways to do. It. For example, like 
in terms of the roll-up block committing to a specific date commitment, they could commit to, say, instead of committing to this tree, they could just commit to, say, the data for this roll-up is actually at this location in the block. So instead of committing to the root, to the actual commitment of the data, they commit to a specific location. So like they say, like, the data is at location number 5, from 5 to 10, like, in the, ro the roll-up selected block. But it's, 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 it's important for the sake of this explanation. So now I've explained, like, um, I've explained why, how do the light nodes verify that these transaction that these follow blocks are inside the celestial block. Now, the way that I've, I've, the, the, the process I've described so far, it only works if you assume that the celestial validator set is honest, or like there's a two thirds of them are honest. If the celestial validator set is dishonest, then they might, as I said before, they might just release a block header, but not um, actually release the data root. The, the data behind the data, data root. So they might like say like, so the, the light client might receive a proof that this data is inside the data root, but the, the validators haven't actually published, data, published the data for, for real. So this is fine if, you're, if, you, if you trust the validator set of Celestia, but this isn't scalable because the whole point of blockchains is that you don't, the, the, the usual threat model for blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum have, for example, is that you don't need to trust the validator set for safety guarantees, because if you trust the if you trust the validator set for safety guarantees, then you're basically giving the validator set the power to like make invalid state transitions or change the policy of the chain or like print money or like steal people's funds, and that's not usually the threat model of blockchains. The threat model of blockchains is usually like you're not supposed to trust any you're not supposed to trust the validator set or the third parties. It's supposed to be a, decent, a decentralized trust minimized network because of the fact that users can actually run, run nodes that verify the state of the chain and verify that it's correct. Like, so no one has to trust the validators. But to uh, achieve that, uh, in this case, the, the obvious, the naive way to achieve that would be simply to require ro roll up celestial nodes to have to download every single transaction in every single celestial block. And that's obviously not scalable because the more, obviously the more block data you have, the more resource requirements that, full n that nodes need to have. And that's, not, uh, that's kind of like antithetical to the value where users should be first class citizens of the network. Is that if users have to download the entire chain, no one can run, people are not gonna run nodes on their computer or, or something like that, or anything, because they don't have, they, they can only run nodes on servers. So to fix that, um, that's, where, that's where data availability sampling comes in. And data availability sampling is a technique that allows light nodes to verify that 100% of the data in a certain block has been published by only downloading a very small percentage of that block. And it does that by um, using this mathematical primitive called erasure coding, which I won't go into now. But the general idea is the light node downloads random chunks from that block. And by, after they download enough random chunks, they have a very high probability guarantee that 100% of the data is available. So like after like 16, if you download, if you download like 16 chunks, then you have like a 99% guarantee. If you download 32 chunks, it's like 99.99% guarantee. And then after a while, like if you have 100 chunks, you have such a high guarantee that the probability of a you being tricked is lower than a hardware failure. Like it's more likely that like a, a photon or something will hit your RAM and flip a bit than it is for like the data availability sampling to fail, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, that, so that's the um, end to end transaction flow. So now let me know if anyone has any questions. Yeah.